Sean is well known in our community because he's spoken at a lot of our meetings and probably has some of his followers on this Zoom call. He is a Texas-based natural conservation and travel photographer, and he works primarily in editorial and commercial assignments, stock and commercial fine arts. He also leads a photo workshop for Ted Turner Reserves. He's past president of the North American Nature Photography Association. And he's also involved with the North American nature photography community, along with the American Society of Media Photographers. And he leads the photographer advocacy efforts on copyright reform and access to public land. His website, which is really easy, is just SeanFitzgerald.com. So you can learn a lot more about his work and see a lot more of his pictures. So I'll turn it over to Sean. Yeah, I appreciate this opportunity. It's uh, it's always a pleasure with you guys. You, you the work you do is really critical, I think, and and much appreciated by many across the spectrum. I'm not a naturalist. I'm more of a visual storyteller, and so what I thought I would do is sort of kind of a variation on what I gave a couple of years ago, and I'm trying to give to as many groups as I possibly can from groups of photographers, you know, camera clubs and whatnot to naturalists, to anybody who want to listen in part, not only to promote prairies as worthy of our affection, I think, even for people who aren't necessarily into prairies or plants on their own, but also as just things for us to appreciate as, as Texans and something that's critical, I think, to the health of the state, which is healthy prairies and grasslands. My interest in part is also because I'm trying, I'm trying to build up to take a few years to try and, and do a, um, like a coffee table book on Texas prairies. That's really what I want to go for. Plus kind of some related projects in part to help more people, more of the general public appreciate the prairies and in turn make choices that perhaps, uh, encourage developers and others to, to leave space for them. It's kind of as simple as that. And I think in terms of for advocates of prairies, visual art, better photos, better videos makes a huge difference. It, it really communicates what's at stake and what's possible in ways that just dry, you know, descriptions or that kind of thing really do not. And, and that's my, you know, kind of aim today is to try to kind of give you guys a sense of maybe how to take a little better pictures and maybe expand the spectrum of ways in which you might use photos for your advocacy and, and whatnot. So I've got a lot of pictures. So I'm just going to jump right into this. So I'm going to talk about photographing prairies for maximum impact. Give you a little bit of an intro. Most of what I'm going to the images I'm going to show are from Texas prairies, although I do have a few from Kansas and New Mexico, short, different kinds of prairies. This one was from Kansas in the tall grass prairie, photographing fireflies one evening and coyotes popped up and just sent chills down my spine. And it's kind of one of those, one of those things that gets into your soul, you know, when you, when you start to experience a prairie on a kind of an emotional level. That's me at, I think that's Climber Meadow up here in North Texas. And that's all your legal mumbo jumbo. If you want to contact me, my email is back there, Sean at SeanFitzgerald.com. I'm happy to answer any questions after this if they don't get answered during our uh, Q&A. And people can feel free to follow up with technical stuff or whatnot. I'm happy to kind of talk about that or cameras or any of that kind of stuff. But I'm going to kind of try to keep it less technical and more to get you to think like a photographer who wants to tell stories in this case about the prairies. So, you know, here's, here's our goal. And unfortunately, the subject of creating an impactful image is kind of, uh, it can be a little complicated, a little interrelated. And for some folks, it can be a little bit intimidating. I'm not going to cover certainly all of this today, but kind of try to give a bird's eye of how to encourage people to be a bit more purposeful when they take photos and give a few tips along the way. And that starts with some sense of 
you understanding what is the purpose you're trying to achieve. And that makes a big difference in your approach. For many of us, I think who photograph the prairies, it falls into a couple of different categories. One are folks who are photographing to help educate, to identify either for themselves or others, species or, or individual parts of, of species. And those who are engaged in visual uh, images for, for scientific purposes. And on the other end of the spectrum, this is where I kind of come from, is more of an emotional or graphic storytelling kind of perspective. Many of the tips I have apply both ways, but the approach you might take for specific images may shift depending on what your purpose is. You'll notice for me, many times I use very soft images where I'm not so much worried about having everything sharp. If you're trying to take pictures for identification, you may want that, you know, have a different mix of what your images look like. When we start thinking about pictures, a lot of times, for most folks, they think if you have a subject and a good composition, you have a good picture. If you're a photographer, you realize that you also need to have light, and that can give you a good photograph. What I suggest for folks who want to get images that sort of rise above is to kind of ask themselves, is there that something extra, you know, some extra element. And we'll touch on that some as we go through this, that elevates the image into something that's kind of special. So if there's not something extra, it doesn't mean you don't take the picture, but I want you to look for it. And that helps. So we're going to start really big, kind of the big picture, and then work our way down to some more specific tips. And I think for the big picture, I think of it in terms of who I am as a photographer. I kind of kind of like to recite mantras and, and just sort of keep myself focused by repetition when I'm out in the field. And what I realized that for me, my formula was four elements. And it's so graphic designer, psychologist, storyteller, and poet. I'm going to touch on those, kind of wrap some of this talk around those, those broad themes. Your formula may be different. Yours may be almost entirely storyteller and not much poet or whatever. And you may have other elements that kind of define what you do when you take photos. The key thing is to kind of keep some of these notions in mind and they help guide you in the field. And I'll, I'll make that a little bit more clear. Let's start with the graphic designer part of it. What we're trying to do when we take pictures is direct the viewer's eyes where you want them to go. You want to have them go where you want them to go. And if they don't, that's kind of a measure of maybe a photo that didn't work. So here's a few examples. One of the things that, you know, we're kind of told is this rule of thirds, which is divide the scene up, the frame up into thirds and have the image, the key part of the image on one of those lines. And this is a literal, literal sort of interpretation of that. But I, I don't find it necessarily applies. To me, it's get this main part of the image out of the center of the frame. And if you can do that, usually the image is stronger. It means that a lot, a lot of the graphic elements then work better. You know, so simply getting your subject off the very dead center part of the frame can work wonders. And often it's even way out to the edges of the frame. Here in the upper right hand is the ladybug in this uh, milkweed. And it, generally it works. Kind of moving that image to out of the center often makes it that much stronger and often it doesn't have to be by it can be just a matter of degrees for living subjects often it's the eyes or the head that you don't want drop dead in the center but just even slightly off with other elements and you know the image works better but i gotta say this when you know for any of these photography is still an art form and it's not about rules so if you have a reason to put your subject drop dead in the center, then do it. And that works just fine. So I, you know, like any rule, rules are made to be broken as, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, when you do it with purpose, often it makes a stronger image. Another kind of graphic tip that I find especially helpful photographing prairies is to try to find subjects if possible in odd numbers, you know, a three or a five. And that creates a number of things. It creates a little tension in the image 
and it creates some natural triangles and triangles are a really strong shape. And by triangle, it's often, you know, it's, it can be very subtle. So even something as simple as a couple of folks out, I think this is on the Kitty Prairie, there's your triangle, just three simple elements in the frame and it helps anchor and draw the viewer's eye in. You know, so often these things are quite subtle. But sometimes, you know, you, you don't get threes. There may be only two of a subject, like this prairie smoke. I think this is New Mexico, in which case, still good. Photograph it. If I added text, and I'll get to that a bit more later for other purpose, now I have three strong elements. I have back to sort of an odd number of subjects in a way. So, you know, I'm going to expand kind of the way you kind of think about using images, especially for design work. One of the other stocks in trade of photographers is the use of lines and curves to guide the viewer through the frame. And this is, you know, this is graphically just takes the viewer and leads them where you want to go. And we find all kinds of ways where we can do this. Sometimes they're not even that necessarily that obvious, but it's, it creates kind of a subtle subconscious you know, the viewer kind of can step into it versus just a wall where they can't move their way through. And those leading lines can move from soft and out of focus into focus. And our eye tends to move up with to the more focused area. So again, we've led them into to see what we want them to see. It works with other, this is a prairie rattlesnake. Again, just using lines to kind of help take the viewer through the scene and where you want them to be makes the difference. You know, all kinds of examples. It's, it's hard to do with wildlife and other things like that, but you can wait for lines just as well as you can with plants and other kinds of subjects. One of the other ways, and I, this is one of my favorite ways, to take the viewer and have them land where you want them to is to use a really shallow depth of field with a longer lens. And that creates just a very shallow zone of focus. You know, this can be hard to do with a cell phone uh, without some specialized sort of tricks and whatnot, but it is getting more doable nowadays. But with, with camera gear, kind of your, uh, you know, regular kind of camera equipment, this is relatively easy to do if you kind of work on doing it. And it really kind of allows you to take one little part inside all the prairie chaos. I don't say that in a derogatory way, but inside all the detail and take the viewer right to that special spot. And I find it to be, you know, just a really beautiful graphic way to kind of create a mood and a feeling that gets the viewer to kind of communicate with your subject. And it can even be done in close-ups where you're just letting the rest of the image go soft and having a very narrow part. In this case, I'm focused primarily just on the eyes. Or in this case, just the very tips of uh, the flower with the understanding that, you know, everything else is going to end up soft and that becomes very easy to use for publication for graphic design for laying text over it or for a PowerPoint. And I'm going to, which gets me to the next part, which is for a lot of photographer people taking pictures in the prairie, I think they're always kind of looking down, taking pictures of stuff of grasses or forbs or flowers or whatever they find when there's a lot more potentially that they could photograph and when they take, they start to think about adding negative space to the scene, it also allows them to use it for additional purposes. And I'll give some examples of that. Simple image like this with lots of space above can then be used for cover of a magazine with the text and other stuff laid on top of it. And I've, I've tried quite a bit to get actual prairie images into magazines like Texas Highways and it works. And, you know, like these wild roses, you know, two page spread, lots of room for text and it has its place. And so if you just kind of slow down and take your shot, but then say, okay, can I add something, you know, a blank neutral part subject that I can lay text on or someone else can lay text on. 
then you have a you have an additional storytelling tool. Another way to do this is by taking a darker white subject background and isolating the subject. This is all out in the field and simply putting some black velvet behind uh, this patch of flowers and allowed me to get them to really stand out. You know, this is all, you know, natural stuff. Put the little background behind it, photograph it, pull it up, walk away and everything's good. And I've got an image that really, really stands out. And this is um, a really effective way to do this. And you can use anything, you know, anything that's that you can hold or prop up behind your subject will work. So second subject, the psycholo psychological part, being the psychologist, understanding how the viewers will react to your image elements. And this gets into something as simple as uh, we read from the left to the right in the West. And when the image kind of flows from left to right, it feels right, or it's more likely to feel right to us, versus flipping that might feel, you know, to a, a more of a Far Eastern or, or culture where they read from right to left, that might, that may be a more effective kind of approach to the image. You know, that's a psychological, I think, response is how I think about it. And it also applies to one of the cardinal rules, if you want to communicate uh, visually is try to avoid clutter and simplify your image. And you can do that in all kinds of ways. One is to learn how to vary your aperture so you can shoot softer so that just a, just what you want is in focus. We've touched on that and we'll come back to that probably some more. The second is to learn how to kind of look at your angle. So you have an image like this which you're looking down and your background is, is quite close and can get kind of cluttered and the, the milkweed can get lost. Well, simply getting down lower where the background is now much softer makes it a little bit stronger image. And often, especially when you get a little bit longer lens, being just down a couple inches extra can give you that really soft out of focus background that can make a really big difference. You know, your subject just completely stands out when you're able to do that. Another thing to kind of keep in, in mind and is to minimize the overlap, you know, little, little elements that overlap, because that's kind of like, it's like bad feng shui. It's kind of a bad vibe when you have parts, you know, different parts of the scene overlapping. And, you know, if you can be kind of aware of that, sometimes just a little nudge one way or another can make all the difference in the world. So this was, I think, actually at the, the get together a couple of years ago out at, this was at the, I think this was the Katy Prairie, you know, trying to photograph people in the field, you know, they're overlapped. It's just kind of psychologically, it doesn't work. So simply waiting a few seconds until you have some separation. And now you have a, a definitely stronger, you know, very simple, but stronger image. And you'll find lots of opportunities where you get just a little bit of motion, a little bit of movement, either you or the subject, and all of a sudden it's, it's that little bit extra visual impact. And often for us, it's, it can be a little bitty, like here in the lower left, second flower from the left at the bottom, just kind of something simple like that can make a, a big difference. So often little tiny tweaks, but it, it adds up. And then psychologically, I, I find, especially for prairie work, kind of the notion of like the light dark duality, um, good versus evil kind of associations we get with things can be very powerful because our eye goes to the light and it makes the subject really stand out. And some of this goes all the way back into paintings and literature where we've kind of been conditioned to have that response. And in a prairie context, it can really make some subjects become almost revered in a way, almost like an iconic spiritual sort of kind of subject. So when you get those opportunities, you can really make those things, make those plants stand out. Here I'm actually popping a flash behind it to make this pen stem and stand out. And along those same lines, when you can get a plant to have a backlit glow, when the sun or a light source you provide lights it from behind and you take that picture, we've already preconditioned to have all these kind of like um, 
almost to elevate it to a divinity, you know, because all of our art and other, you know, visual imagery through you know, centuries have kind of pre preconditioned us to respond that way. And so I always look for opportunities to backlight and it really makes the image sort of the plant seem a little bit more angelic and it's it emphasizes details in a really wonderful way i think that oftentimes we don't see otherwise and so often it's just having a dark shadows in the background and then the sun may be hitting it from behind and then you may have to adjust your exposure a little but these images can be done and they really make your subjects like this rattlesnake master just pop just stand out sometimes you can do it where you get just sort of this uh beautiful uh, backlit kind of flare that goes on and make your make your subject stand out and you know there's really no limit to it what you can capture this way once you start to see the world sometimes from both uh, the sun over your shoulder and then the sun in your eyes and and seeing if you can take pictures in response so that's one of my favorite ways to photograph and i encourage people to to try it it just gives a beautiful visual drama the third part of my formula is thinking of yourselves as a storyteller. So you choose the stories you want to tell. And that can be in a single image or in multiple images, you know, where you add pieces to a puzzle that store that tell a story uh, once they're all assembled together. And we I think we all know that there's just a wealth of stories to be had out here in a, in a healthy, vibrant prairie. The question is, what stories do you want to tell? And then We'll get to this in a bit. How do you want to tell them? And that's going to vary for everybody. I, I, I have my favorites, stuff that I'm constantly looking for. One of those is man and nature, sort of that juxtaposition between and conflict between humanity and the natural world and sort of the uneasy balance between the two. So I look for those themes, especially in prairie work, when we're dealing with so many remnants that are just jammed up against man-made objects or barely hanging on against development. And it can give a really, a lot of context to a subject versus just lots of pretty pictures. It doesn't really tell the whole story nowadays. So I'm constantly looking for those opportunities to kind of tell that bigger story and, you know, sometimes, you know, the stories are not necessarily ones I want to be finding, like looking for beautiful prairie in the Katy, in the Katy Prairie and finding business parks that are profiting off the name, but I couldn't find any prairie on this business park. Imagine that. But those kinds of images can, can have an impact. And so, you know, this is the Blackland Prairie, fairly common odd practice that I don't think works for any purpose, but, you know, helps tell that story and give a sense of, you know, kind of the complete picture, both the good and the bad. It's kind of that man's conflict, humanity's conflict with, with nature. Sometimes it's can be very subtle, you know, using a very shallow depth of field can kind of allow you to layer these textures together where it's not quite so literal. And the second thing about storytelling, and this is kind of my big couple of things that I look for, is looking for the decisive moments. Capture that just right, you know, image that really tells the story about a particular scene. And so we look for those chances. And sometimes with a, with a painted bunning and these giant cone flowers, it may be just a, a split second when the bird turns its head just right. And this is where having a camera that allows you to shoot lots of frames can help. It definitely does help. So click away and then choose the one that's the best later. But often they're, in the prairie, it's often very simple moments that, are, that you want to capture just at that kind of apex of action or, or whatever, you know, that really defines that, that moment in that scene. And sometimes that has to do with light. As people you know, start to take more pictures, you realize sometimes that the light can be just as fleeting as a bird alighting on a branch and uh, then taking off again. You know, sometimes with the, the most beautiful light is only there for minutes or seconds sometimes. And so you have to, you have to be quick and purposeful about capturing that particular moment. And then with storytelling, I find that 
I don't want to just capture the big picture. I like to think in terms of the big picture and then going in progressively to the more into details, you know, so I start with a sense of place that tells the viewer where I am. And then I go in and show details that really let them kind of get immersed in, in kind of the smaller worlds within. And, you know, there's no shortage of opportunities to do this in a prairie, I think. I mean, there's just so, gosh, there's just so much detail uh, in these prairie ecosystems and all the plants and animals and whatnot that inhabit it. And so, when I mentioned before about sometimes you tell stories in, in groups, and that's absolutely the case. And kind of keeping, and sometimes you kind of have to kind of work to kind of fill these out. So for example, I had some milkweeds in the back of my, where I live in Dallas and in my warehouse, had some planters back there, planted milkweed, attracted, gosh, just this one poor monarch dumped about 40 eggs on us. And so we were struggling to get them fed. And so I photographed him, some of the caterpillars as they grew in different ways and trying to tell that story, you know, across kind of that, uh, that whole growth, including, you know, a little bit of video to kind of show a little bit of the story. And, you know, this always makes me laugh. They're just mowing these things down. And I don't even want to tell you how much we spent in milkweed and <laughs> things trying to keep these guys fed. But you end up where you start from just this tiny caterpillar back to the point where it entirely has mowed down the milkweed. And that's kind of a nice progression that, that helps tell that complete story. Now, aside from the what stories to tell is the how to tell your story. And this really gets into your, I don't know, your visual style, the, the flavor you want to impart. You know, everyone has a different sort of flair, I suppose. For some, it's simply getting everything sharp so it works for your purpose. For others, you know, maybe there's more of a poetic aspect to it where they're, we're trying to attract. For me, I like to push for more emotional, more abstract, more surreal images. And so I'm always looking for those opportunities. And when you start to look that way, you start to see familiar subjects in different ways, especially out in the prairie, where, you know, you can, you can create moods in, in, in kind of unexpected ways once you start looking at the, the prairie that way. Again, for me, often it's uh, using a longer lens and just a very narrow zone of focus to kind of create dreamy effects. And sometimes it's kind of a, just kind of adapting to the opportunity. In this case, this is a Fort Prairie where there's a trail through you know, this, this field of flowers. And, you know, I thought it was quite lovely. And then I, I can't remember if it was the same day or another day I came back and the wind was whipping. And so I decided to slow the shutter speed down because it made me feel like a, a literal ocean like a waving, like water flowing. And so I adjusted the way I shot the image based on how it made me feel, basically. So I think that's the poetry of it. We all have our own voice in what we want to express. And we get all kinds of opportunities. When we go from the literal to the more abstract, and let the wind paint the image. And, you know, even that's all in the, in the span of you know, 20, 30 seconds of taking pictures. You just kind of have to be a little bit more purposeful about looking for those chances. You know, even something like using a fisheye lens and leaving it uncorrected so that it creates the impression that the world is a prairie, which was my intent. And often it's, it can be a matter of just inches to get a totally different feel. In this case, Dick Sissel, I guess, was there and I shot some kind of straight up shots images. And then I thought, you know what it would look like if I just kind of made this as abstract as I possibly could. And so, you know, just scooched over a couple feet, found a spot and, and made it that much more surreal. So it's definitely doable. Now we're kind of funneling down into some more helpful techniques. And one of those is for me, and this is not necessary, depends on what you want to shoot. But for me, I, I like to use a tripod 
and bring along a cable release, set up on a scene, make it perfectly composed how I want it, and then I'll wait. You know, you simply wait till your subject, your actual subject comes along. And so it comes to you instead of you chasing it and usually never getting the actual shot you want. The other thing that I do oftentimes is use a wide angle lens to take environmental portraits. And so I am literally usually, you know, six, eight, 10 inches away from my subjects for these kinds of shots. And that really creates both kind of an intimate subject with the plant in the front, yet you still see a soft out of focus background in the back, which gives you a sense of the place, the bigger story. And there's all, all kinds of ways to do this, but they're, they tend to have the same effect in that you get both something intimate and broader story that comes through. The other thing I do all the time is use a long lens, often really long lens to compress element to it. It kind of squeezes things together. Like here, downtown Dallas and a little patch of Blackland Prairie uh, out in New Mexico, you know, trying to push, push elements together that tell a bigger story. And it creates kind of a unique look too, which, which rather than shooting with the same sort of focal distance all the time, lower left, there's a Vermilion flycatcher kind of gets lost there, but you know, it really makes that difference. And then the other thing I encourage people to do is to learn how to push your, for those with regular cameras, how to push your ISO, your film speed, so that, uh, and not to be afraid of shooting really fast. You know, in this case, it's well past dusk. It's, uh, I forget what kind of moon this was, but it was really spectacular uh, moonrise and had to take the camera way up in order to get a sharp shot. And sometimes that means adjusting, you know, and not giving up, you know, in this case, trying to figure out what to do and capture the shot and ended up having to take the shutter speed way up and it works. And so, you know, learning your camera and being able to push it to get shots allows you to kind of walk away with images where otherwise you're just frustrated. And so take it in small bites, small steps, but it's, it's definitely doable. The, the other thing about kind of the poetry of it is you, you learn how to push the edges of the light. Lighting makes a huge difference. And if I had to just give you one quickie rule, it would be avoid harsh light or flat light and look for soft light and warm light, light with some direction. And, you know, it makes just a wonderful difference in the image. So sometimes, you know, often ends of the day, the sun at the lower on the horizon is very is much softer atmosphere, uh, fog, clouds uh, will give you a softer light, sunrise, sunset, you know, all will also help soften that light, give you more of the pastels and kind of more of the details that you get at that time of the day. You know, it can be a little challenging to learn how to shoot into the sun in certain situations, but it's worth it. Uh, one of the tips I would give you is just be conscious when you're shooting into the sun about lens flare. So sometimes you have to hold, I actually quite like this, but sometimes it becomes overwhelming. What I did in this next image was kind of change the perspective and hold my hand or a hat over to block the sun from hitting the front of the lens. And you get that. And this is literally the same patch of flowers, just a few seconds apart. And you get totally different sort of uh, feel to the images. Uh, often I'll shoot them both. So I have them both, but sometimes the lens flare is too much and you just don't get anything you like. One of the things about light is that you're not stuck necessarily with only what you have. I'm not going to get too deep into this, but I, one simple concept for you guys to understand is that the sun in the sky is a specular light, I meaning it's, it's a really small light source in relation to the subject. So look at the, where the flower is, look at the shadows. The shadows are really harsh. Now, to make a specular light into a soft light, you can do a couple of things. One of them is to diffuse it. So literally one cloud in front of the sun creates, now the cloud, which is five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 times bigger than the sun, is your light source because this light is getting diffused through it and the sad shadows instantly soften. The other way to create a less specular light source is to move your light source closer to your subject. And that will instantly 
create a softer, more uh, subdued, and usually more pleasant image. There are ways to kind of cheat with this. You can buy, you know, pretty inexpensive little reflectors that bounce light or diffusers where the sun kind of diffuses through and then hits your subject, but anything can work. And sometimes the best thing is to just put your body, just cover your subject in your own shade and then take a, a closer picture. And that will instantly often create a better image than trying to shoot the image in bright sunlight. Here's a quick example shooting, you know, that's a diffuser, just kind of put it right over the sun to kind of create and put my subjects in uh, softer light. So that's direct sunlight with all kinds of highlight and contrast. It's just really hard to, to deal with. And that's simply softening the light. And now everything is nice, soft, gentle light. And it's a lot, I think, a lot better image. So a few examples. On the left, no reflector. I'm bouncing light in from the sun. On the right, I have a little simple reflector, popped it out, bounced the sun in, take the picture. You know, that little bit makes, I think, makes a huge difference. And it's really easy for anybody to kind of do that, you know, kind of taking pictures out in the prairies. Sometimes it's, uh, and you can push this, you can combine different things together, uh, bouncing and diffusing and, and uh, adding light, like from a flash or a little LED light, and you can create totally different fields to images. This is just with a little LED light. I can show you one uh, when we do Q&A. Here's two little LED lights. One is on the front cone flower, and the other one is lighting up the background. And so it creates this real buzz. And then I'm definitely not going to get into flash because it's kind of a tougher subject technically, but it can make a massive difference. You know, this, these, those two images are shot just images apart. And so it definitely has its place and allows you to kind of push, um, you know, kind of push the edges of the light more when you learn how to use flash. But any light sources can be handy. This is on at Rita Blanca up in the Texas Panhandle for assignment. So let me wrap this up. I use, if I had just a few tips, I would say use soft light, keep your composition simple, work from big to small, and then shoot literal subjects. And then ask yourself there's, if there's something more abstract you can do. And then always be looking for that something extra in your image. So I'm going to give now kind of just give some examples uh, with a subject, and then we'll take this into some, some a little Q&A. So this is just kind of like photographing uh, prairie burns, you know, going from big picture storytelling, trying to capture decisive moments, using leading lines, kind of uh, compressing elements, using backlighting to add a little bit extra drama. In this case, you know, using a wide, wide angle lens to kind of put those elements in and then working from the literal to looking for the abstract, you know, this heat diffraction on prairie fires is just awesome for abstracts. And you can get some, some really surreal, almost Van Gogh-ish kind of images sometimes when you start to look at the world that way. And then progressively, like we talked about before, moving in. Uh, shooting the details that kind of define some of the intimate parts of a scene and then looking for all aspects of it. Like in this case, uh, I think it was a little copperhead that didn't make it out of the, the fire zone. And then working on kind of the, the drama and just the graphic elements that kind of speak to the poet, the poetic part of, uh, of kind of an experience. And that really kind of, fleshes out the, the, the whole story. And then that said, I'm going to leave you with this, which is there are definitely easy ways. You can do this on your iPhone. I think there's some, some um, apps and on uh, Google and iPhone that allow you to quickly assemble, you know, little video clips and pictures together and lay text upon them. One of them is like Enlight Video Leap. I haven't used it in a couple of years, but I think it's still out there. It allows you to do something simple. And this is my last example, kind of like this, where I just went out on this uh, great seed bomb, just kind of laying seeds out to kind of help 
and just took some pictures and of kind of the folks volunteering that day and realized I was kind of telling a little story within a day and I could just lay a little text on top of it and crop it square and post it to Instagram to kind of help the project. And so, you know, you, you learn, once you learn to do this, you can really use very simple tools to tell your story and share it much more broadly. That's what I've got. I'm happy to take questions. There's a question on your Instagram and there's a question on cell phones and some technical questions. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me start off with kind of cell phone. And I, I have to say that you can do an awful lot with the cell phones. I mean, they are really, especially the last few generations are pretty fantastic. And now they're starting to integrate actual close-up focusing, which is for us is awesome. You know, we can really focus close on subjects in ways we never could before. The problem with uh, cell phones is twofold. One of them is they tend to be really wide angle. So they show a really wide perspective typically, and they don't zoom in the way like I, a lot of mine do. And, and, and the other problem I think with, with cell phones is the way just because of the way they're designed uh, with the lens so close to the sensor, almost everything is always sharp. So trying to get those more, you know, more artistic, softer backgrounds can be a challenge. But on some of the phones now, you've got, you can use software to soften the background and you can get little uh, add-ons, you know, pretty inexpensive you know, $30, $40 add-ons that allow you to close focus and other stuff and, and, and get a softer background. So the, I, the, the phones are closing the gap, you know, there, but there's still some things that you can't, you still need a regular camera for the cameras for the inexpensive stuff. I'll say this, most of the camera world is switching from the old school SLRs, the digital SLR single lens reflex, where they have a mirror inside that physical mirror that closes and a lot of people are switching to mirrorless where, you know, we'll get into all that stuff, but it's the, kind of the new thing. What that means is you can get a really, really good digital SLR camera used uh, right now because so many people are switching and there's nothing the matter with those. They take cameras, they take pictures that are every bit as good as the newer kind of uh, mirrorless ones. Um, so I would look there, um, you know, any of them, I, what I would not do is, is I would try to save my money for a camera that's, I don't know, in the last three, four, five years in terms of used ones. A 10-year-old digital camera, often with a few exceptions, um, is really is way, way behind. And so there, there have been some nice, you know, some advancements. Like in Canon, the, Re the digital Rebels of the last three, four, five years are really quite good for an inexpensive camera. And I'm happy to help with that. If anyone has questions, my that's my uh, email. Is it me an email? I'll give you a call and we can talk it through. In terms of uh, some of the other stuff, um, the, you know, you end up, you can buy one of these little simple things for 20 bucks. This is a diffuser. You can get them a diffuser and then a reflector and they literally just pop open like this. And then you just use it in the field and then fold it up, stick it in your backpack and then walk where you want. And that can be great. Um, but like I said, oftentimes you just, you know, if this was your subject and the sun is behind me, just, just take your phone and block the sun so that your subject's in shade. Shade is soft and almost always gives a better picture than direct sunlight for, for plants. I mean, you know, nine times out of 10, uh, that's gonna be the case. And then the other thing you can look out for, for people who wanna push the edges a little bit, this is, um, this is a really awesome little light from a company called Nightcore, N-I-T-E-C-O-R-E. And you can, and it's, I think there's like 85 bucks. You can get these as cheap as this, things like this is $40, $50 now. And I can literally just turn the lights on. And now I can light a subject really beautifully. 
and you don't have to worry about flash or anything like that. So, and with a, with a iPhone and something like this, let's say this is our plant. I've got my phone. Now I can hold the light behind the plant. Say this, say my pump, say this is my phone. Here's my flower. Now I can even come behind and backlight a, you know, a, a beautiful flowering plant and get something close to the images that I showed you using thousands of dollars worth of gear. And so I don't want to scare anybody off into thinking, you know, that you have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars because you don't have to, to take better pictures. And, um, and for people trying to save a few, this is a good time photographically because there's bargains to be had out there in the camera world. There's a question for the types of lenses for long distance and up close. Yeah, for, you know, depending on what your budget is. And again, I can help. If you want to go up close, you know, I, I mean, I find that having a wide angle lens, which in 35 millimeter equivalent is like, you know, 16 to 35, something like that, really is a kind of bread and butter lens for me for uh, the wide stuff. And then the, 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 the longer lens can be anything that gets you from 70 to 200 or, you know, nowadays I'm using a 100 to 500 lens all the time. I've got bigger ones, but that's, that's what I'm using quite a bit, 100, 400, 100 to 500. But even an inexpensive 70 to 200, 70 to 300 that will allow you to focus relatively close. When you shop for a lens for plant work, check how close it focuses. So actually try that in the camera store or look it up online. And the closer it focuses at a zoomed in, you know, longer telephoto, the better it's going to be for our work. Um, beyond that, uh, you can get a special macro lens. And a macro lens is one, a true one is one that goes down to one to one ratio, which is going to end up being like this. So that would be a one-to-one -one lens, you know, about this size. Uh, and then on those, again, you know, you can get great values on used macro lenses out there. You know, if you look for them, you don't have to spend a fortune on them. But that's only if you're doing really close, tight stuff. Um, the other part of it is a relatively recent good uh, camera. They usually have 20 to megapixels. And I've done, I've done two page magazine spreads off of two megapixel images and 60 inch prints off of less than seven or eight megapixels. So you can crop way into a scene, you know, to get details if you want. So you don't necessarily have to have special macro gear to get these, cl these close up shots that you, that you want to share online or in presentations or something like that. I do have an Instagram account. I have no idea what the handle is. And I actually am going to start posting to it again. I've been at war with Instagram on copyright stuff, but I will start posting more Prairie stuff there. And if you, if you just go to my website and there should be a link, seanfitzgerald.com, and then it should be a link to the Instagram. Uh, classes, there's a ton of good online stuff, honestly. Uh, there's just so much good online content now for filmmaking, yeah, uh, email me. I think I've got some resources I can give you for filmmaking stuff. Just, just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you a couple spots. My favorite prairies, gosh, they're all so beautiful. I have an affinity for the Blackland Prairie because I live here and I've done so much work in it. But every time I go to a new prairie in Texas, I'm just blown away by the capabilities, by the, or the, the beauty of it. And yet the fragility of it. I mean, every time I'm on a prairie, it, you almost feel like it's just draining away in front of your eyes. You know, we're losing Fort Worth Prairie at a massive rate right now. And I, and I, I really want to spend more time in the coastal prairie and Katy Prairie and, 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 you know, down your neck of the woods. But it's, it's kind of daunting to see how little of it's left. Although, you know, uh, the advocates down with around the Katy Prairie have done some really great stuff. I'm on the board of the Native Prairies Association of Texas. And so I've access to some of their properties and, um, you know, appreciate everybody who's, who's working to preserve that. Um, 
let's see, what is my background now? I am, let's see, <laughs> background. I am full-time photographer. I'm also uh, occasionally practicing lawyer. I mostly haven't practiced for 20 years, but I've reactivated and doing um, a little stuff to help my wife and working on copyright. But I am primarily working, um, you know, photography projects and gearing up to hopefully shoot a, like I said, if I can get a taker on publishing it, uh, a Texas Prairie's book that really, really highlights it. Let's see. I guess just general equipment. I think a basic kit, let me put it this way. A sturdy tripod, contact me, I can help you, can really open up. It, it really expands what you can do. And it makes, especially the close-up work, a lot easier, I think, at the end of the day. For people who just want to run and gun, take a picture, put it on iNaturalist or whatever, you know, just use your phone. I mean, that's fine. But you can take better pictures with your phone. Um, but for those who want to push it, you can get by with simply, you know, a, a good, um, a decent camera, uh, a tripod that you can use fairly well, kind of a wider angle lens, and then sort of a longer, you know, 7200, a little bit longer zoom, and you're good. You can do pro work with that. You know, so it does not have to be, you know, some great big kit and thousands, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of stuff. And yes, I will let the whole world know if <laughs> my fairy book comes available. Uh, what I do ask, and the only way for me to make this happen is uh, I'm, I'm, I need friends. I need friends who can tell me, uh, who, and who are willing to say, hey, you need to come out to the Katy right now or, you know, whatever, because there is something, this is awesome going on. Um, as an example, I reached out to somebody on something else, Prairie, about 150 miles east of here to a lady and she came back and said yeah hey you know what i've got a uh um a purple martin roost on my prairie <laughs> and so i'm set up to photograph it and we've we're going to do it for i think a uh, magazine and um uh, i would never have known about that and so so i kind of want to reach out anybody who's got tips i'm listening any uh, ideas uh or wants or can think about it tell me you know what's happening when um uh, even at the last minute. And, and that, that's, that would be very helpful. So I'll be reaching out once I get this thing fully going. Um, and probably I would anticipate it'll take me a couple of years, but I want it to be pretty intense. So. We've got some urban prairies in our neck of the woods. So you can come down and visit with us. Oh, well, yeah, please, please let me know about those. Cause I think that's a yeah. key part of the story. I mean, I've been uh, like in Dallas, we've got a couple patches along White Rock Lake, and there's one, there's a couple of really spectacular prairies in Fort Worth that are little remnants. And that's a key part of the story because we're yeah. left mostly with remnants. And I think showing that not only can prairies coexist with urban areas, but that if we are more thoughtful about it, we can link them together and create corridors you know, that serve all kinds of purposes, you know, and so th that's that. Yeah, that's the, I, I need those. <laughs> I need those photo. Uh, uh, you know, I've got a database where I'm keeping trying to build up all the, the things I need to shoot. So yes, please, please feel free to send any, anything like that along. And, um, you know, ultimately, if I had a dirty little goal at the end was would be to create so much demand for prairies that developers have to start giving. <laughs> You know, they have to start meeting that demand. And I think that's part of our problem. We don't have enough demand for it. People also, don't appreciate also, it. People see prairies and they think snakes and coyotes and they don't think. We or they all think, want. yeah, it ha it's, it's just land waiting to be developed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's wasted. Uh, uh, yeah. It's, ways, yeah, it's yeah. just, it's just in holding. And yeah. I think, you know, and, 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 and I think if we could change the demand model to get it to where people are demanding that prairies are included in, you know, all across the spectrum. Um, you know, that's what t in part Texas needs. Otherwise we're screwed. <laughs> it's going to be all gone. <laughs> I, well, just well, I, I just don't, I don't want to live in that Texas. I just don't want to live in that Texas. Well, I appreciate it. And um, good luck with your work. And I, I hope to see you sometime in the future. <laughs>